Module 26 is all about the Federal Reserve. We're going to learn about the economic conditions that led to its founding. You will need to know the date that it was founded. We'll talk about how it's currently organized and also how it's responded to crises since then. So there's no equations in Module 26, no economic models, but actually quite a few things that have been asked on AP exams. So it is worth focusing on. The Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States. So it's not like other banks in the sense that most banks in America are for-profit organizations, but the Federal Reserve is not. This is partly governmental in the sense that there is some congressional approval of some of the things that happen with the Federal Reserve, but it's mostly an independent institution that oversees and regulates banks. Banks often bank with the Federal Reserve. It also is in charge of the monetary base, which is the amount of bank reserves and the amount of currency in circulation because the Federal Reserve is the only group that's allowed to print currency in America. Before the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, we had a series of national banks. These were banks were like chains that were in multiple parts of the country and national banks were allowed to print their own currency. They could only print the amount of currency that corresponded with the capital in the bank. So if there was $200,000 deposited in your bank, they of course couldn't print currency in excess of $200,000. So there wasn't any counterfeiting or things like that. But the idea is these national banks had their own, you can see the pictures showing the different currencies, different denominations of the currencies, different colors, different sizes. And these national banks had to send these dollars to all the banks under their control. But there wasn't any system of transporting the cash or liquidity. So in times of bank crises, we didn't have any way to get cash to banks quickly. In the late 1800s, when we had these national banks all across America, there were limits to transportation compared to today. So imagine these dollars that were printed being transported through railroad, through boats, through wagons and things like this nature. So the idea was large banks had no problem accessing liquidity because they were near the printing centers. But rural banks that were part of these national chains, if they were low on reserves, there were often large delays of getting the cash to the banks that needed them. And so when people would go to the bank seeking money for withdrawals, if the bank didn't have enough money on hand, that could lead to bank runs. And bank runs, as you learned, can be contagious in the sense that when one bank fails, people panic and they go to other banks in the community seeking cash. If it's a rural community, those banks probably don't have huge amounts of cash in their vaults either. So these bank runs really destroyed a lot of rural banks. In 1913, the national banking system was eliminated and the Federal Reserve System was created. You do need to know that year 1913, so do some highlighting or stars around it, something to make it stand out. The Federal Reserve was created in order to work with deposit taking institutions. Now this wording might look a little bit strange to you. If you're wondering, why don't you just say banks? Well, because there's other types of deposit taking institutions, like for example, credit unions. And the Federal Reserve has jurisdiction over all of these. So their job was to make sure that all of these deposit taking institutions hold enough reserves. So the name Federal Reserve tells you that they wanna make sure that there's enough in reserves by each bank that banks don't have runs where they run out of money. The Federal Reserve also has regional regulators that check in with the banks to make sure that they are doing the right things in terms of reserves and other regulations set up from the Federal Reserve. By the way, 
Even though the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, that isn't when the regulations stopped evolving. As our banking system changes, we have more regulations that go into effect, and sometimes regulations are taken off the books. So these things are updated from time to time. Also, the Federal Reserve is the only entity in America that has the right to issue currency. So we're not only talking about dollar bills, this also includes coins. Just for fun, I thought it would be neat to look at some of the original dollar bills printed from the Federal Reserve. So when we're switching from all of those regional banks and their own currencies, the Federal Reserve had to figure out what did they want the dollar bills to look like. So first of all, it's worth noting that there was one, there was no one dollar bill back then. They actually would just use a dollar coin or gold coin or a silver coin equal to one dollar instead of having a one dollar bill. We also had some pretty big denominations. There are some faces on these things like Benjamin Franklin, um, Sam and Chase was in some of the bills, so people that are not currently on our dollar bills. So there have been some changes. Um, Andrew Jackson, as you can see, the $10 bill is not on the $10 bill now. So on the backs of the bills look different from how they do nowadays. So we've changed the dollar bills quite a bit. Some of the reasons were to um, reduce counterfeiting. But there's also lots of political pressure and other reasons why we've changed the bills over time. Where the Federal Reserve falls can be very confusing because when you see a question asking about which government policy can solve the problem, government policies actually apply to both fiscal policy and monetary policy. The Federal Reserve controls monetary policy. So if you're wondering, wait a minute, how is monetary policy a government policy if the Federal Reserve is separate from the government? The reason is that there are some connections. If you look in blue, we have three parts of the current Federal Reserve, the Board of Governors, the 12 regional banks, and the Federal Open Market Committee. The only area that the government has any control over is the Board of Governors, the first part. So we're going to actually see on the next slide where the government is involved. But once the Board of Governors has been appointed, that's it. From that point on, the Federal Reserve is an independent group, and they are able to make decisions separately with no oversight, um, with no requirement that they get approval from the government. So is the Federal Reserve part of the government? Kind of, not really. We wanted there to be separation between the executive branches of our government. We didn't want the president and Congress to be able to print currency because in places where that is in existence in some countries where a monetary is not separate, then you lead to see a lot of corruption and you see a lot of high rates of inflation. So we did want there to be some political separation, but there is a little bit of governmental involvement, at least with the Board of Governors. The Board of Governors is the first part of the Federal Reserve. Later on in these notes, we're going to see that there's not just a Board of Governors, but there's also a Board of Directors. So one way to help differentiate these is the Board of Governors are the leaders for the Federal Reserve, and they meet in the capital of our government, Washington, D.C. The Board of Governors are also the only ones that are appointed by the government. So you can see all the connections there in this term, Board of Governors. So the Board of Governors are seven members, and they do have to be appointed by the president and confirmed or approved by the Senate. Now, what's really special about the Board of Governors is that they serve 14-year terms. The idea is there's seven of them. They actually have a new one that starts every two years. So there's these staggered appointments within the Board of Governors. But if you are serving a 14-year term, the idea is you are not worried about being reappointed because 
the board members here actually can't be. Once they serve a 14-year term, they can't be reappointed again. So they have nobody to please. There's no political pressure. The reason for these long terms is that a lot of times um, – Congress people and senators feel like they are always working to please their constituents. And your constituents might say that they always think that tax cuts are a great thing. But as you guys know, as econ students, tax cuts are not always a good thing. There are certain times in the economy where, like an inflationary period, for example, that if you cut taxes, you actually increase spending, you make inflation, the inflationary gap, worse. So these Board of Governors realize that there are certain things that might not please voters, but that are best for the economy, especially in the long term. And that's why they serve such long terms. If the people in charge of the government don't like what the Board of Governors are doing, they cannot fire them. There's been no precedent for that ever set up. So this is why even though they're appointed by the government, they're not controlled by the government. And even if the government might want the Board of Governors to do something in terms of interest rates, they can't actually make them do it. So you can see that gray area, appointed by the government but not controlled by the government. From within the Board of Governors, the chairperson is appointed. Their term is much shorter. It's only four years as opposed to 14 years. Oftentimes, the chair of the Federal Reserve is reappointed. It really depends on if the powers that be in charge of appointments believe that the economy is going well. If everything is going smoothly, they often will keep the same Fed chair in power regardless of if it's a Democrat or Republican controlled Congress and president. Um, but when things are not going smoothly, they tend to not reappoint and pick someone else. So the most recent Fed chairs, Ben Bernanke on this table, um, his term ended in 2014. So he, you can see that's eight years, so he served two terms. Do you know who the current Fed chair is? Answer will be on the next slide. The current Fed chair is Janet Yellen. So I'm recording this in 2017. I will try to keep this up to date. So if she does not get reappointed and we have a different Fed chair, I'll let you know. But Janet Yellen, I like this picture because you can see where she came from. She was the Federal Reserve vice chair before becoming the chair. She is the first woman that we've ever had as the ched of, chair of the Federal Reserve. And she was sworn in in 2014. So think about how long is that term and when will her term be up? Okay, this is a four year appointment, which means that her term would be up in 2018. When the Federal Reserve was created, they also set up 12 regional banks. They remembered that if you have only the ability to print money in certain parts of the country, then it becomes very difficult to spread liquidity around, to respond to crises, and also to be aware of different economic situations in different parts of the country. So these 12 regional banks were set up at that time. As you can see, we're in Region 5, the Richmond Regional Bank. So you do need to know that we are in the Richmond area, but that's larger than just Virginia. You can see that it's also including Maryland, West Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Some of these regions are larger than others. They were set up based on the population distribution at the time. So that's why District 12 covers such a large geographic area. Um, and it's possible that they might do some redistricting of these regional banks if they see the need, but they haven't changed uh, since, the for since the formation of the Fed. The regional bank's job are to provide supervision of the regional banks. They do audits. So the idea is when you saw that the Federal Reserve has to make sure that banks are keeping up with their capital requirements, their reserve requirements, it's these regional banks that are checking up on them. Each regional bank is run by a board of directors.
that's where we're seeing the difference between Board of Governors, which is only one Board of Governors that runs the Federal Reserve, and then there's 12 different Board of Directors, one of each regional bank. These Board of Directors come from the local banking and business community. So these are people that should have um, really their eye on banking regulations, but also know about the economic conditions of their region. Because what might be important to New York City might not be important to Wisconsin and vice versa. So the Federal Reserve really wants to know what's happening in different parts of the country. And the Board of Directors help bring this to their attention. The last part of the Federal Reserve is the Federal Open Market Committee, or FOMC. So this is where open market operations are carried out. You're going to learn in Module 27 about the main tools of the Federal Reserve. There are three, and one of the biggest ones that they do today is buying and selling government bonds. That's part of open market operations. The New York Regional Bank of the Federal Reserve has a special role in terms of these open market operations that we'll find out on the next slide. And you can see a picture here of Ben Bernanke in the middle, that is the former Fed Chairman, sitting with the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, at the time. Over here you have Janet Yellen. So the current Fed Chair was actually Vice Chair, she was part of the Board of Governors before becoming the Chair. So the Federal Open Market Committee does a lot with monetary policy because they are deciding whether or not we buy or sell government bonds, treasury bonds, which actually is part of how money supply can be increased or decreased. The Federal Open Market Committee consists of the Board of Governors, so those seven people in Washington, D.C. that are appointed, as well as five of the regional bank presidents. And there's a rotation. The New York Regional Bank president is always on the committee, and the other four spots rotate. New York has a special place on the Federal Open Market Committee for a few reasons. So we have the stock market in New York City, so there's some unique economic implications that New York understands. New York has also been involved in bailing us out during some tough economic times. So during some early crises in the early 1900s, as well as even in 2008, the New York Regional Bank stepped in and bailed out some of these things before they failed. So New York gets to have this permanent spot on the Federal Open Market Committee. Again, in this picture, we can see Ben Bernanke, and Janet Yellen on the FOMC. So when was the Federal Reserve created again? 1913. If you think about some American history, 1913 was before the Great Depression. And we had bank runs that we were talking about in the 1930s. So even though the Federal Reserve was created to solve a lot of these economic problems, it hasn't totally eliminated them. We've still had major bank runs and the Great Depression and the Great Recession since the Fed was created. So we've had continual new laws that come from Congress in order to regulate the banking industry. So sometimes Congress says what the law should be for regulation, and then the Federal Reserve is in charge to actually audit those banks, check on those banks, and make sure that they are following along with the regulations that Congress set forth. So again, you can see that connection where Congress does have some governmental involvement with the Federal Reserve. The issue with a lot of these problems is that prior to 2008 and the Great Recession, a lot of regulators and a lot of people in Congress felt like the Great Depression was a really long time ago. And bank runs, ever since FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, was invented, they hadn't really been a problem. So during the 1980s, Congress did a lot of deregulation. They got rid of a lot of the banking regulations that they had put in place 
during the 1930s as a result of bank runs in the Great Depression. So there are actually new problems that were created by deregulation. Nowadays, we can look back on it and see the reason it had been so long since the Great Depression and the bank runs is because the regulations were working. And when we deregulated it in the 1980s, that set up a lot of conditions where problems could occur that led us into the Great Recession in 2008. Some of the issues that led to the financial crisis that started the Great Recession in 2008 include capital mismanagement. So we're talking about assets and money that had been mismanaged for quite a long time after this deregulation. Also subprime lending and the housing bubble. This is gonna be about mortgages and loans to people for homes. And then finally, how the, the Federal Reserve responded to this crisis. To explain capital mismanagement, we have to talk about hedge funds. So hedge funds are private investment companies for the super rich. So oftentimes people who were millionaires would consolidate their money into one hedge fund and then buy investments in bulk. So think of the mutual funds we learned about where instead of buying individual stocks, you could buy a collection of stocks. Hedge funds are kind of like mutual funds, but they're buying really expensive investments that you can only afford if you are extremely wealthy. So they wouldn't even allow you in to the hedge fund unless you could meet this uh, minimum investment that often was $1 million. Most of the regulations from the Federal Reserve are to protect people and to protect their investments to make sure that the American public feels safe with the stock market, etc. Well, hedge funds were by people that were not really concerned about protecting their investments. They were risky by choice. It's that whole idea where low risk, low reward, high risk, high reward. So if I have huge amounts of money to invest and I'm pooling my money with other extremely wealthy people, they weren't concerned about regulations that limited them to keep their money safe. They wanted it to go as high risk, high reward as possible. So that's why this new type of investment, the hedge fund had very low regulation. Another thing that added to the risk of these investments is the idea that they were using computer model models to predict where to invest. So they felt like their risk was actually reduced because they were making money, making money, making money. It was going really well. In order to have even more money to invest, they start leveraging their investments. Leveraging means that you're actually taking out a loan or borrowing money to invest. Now, this is something that the average everyday person would not be permitted to do. You would not get a loan for this because it's very, very dangerous. Normally, you buy a stock, the stock does poorly, you lose your original investment, the end. That's the worst thing that could possibly happen. But if you're leveraging an investment, you're borrowing that money. So in that case, if I bought a $1,000 stock with a loan, well, if that stock goes bad, I now can't pay back the loan. So you have these domino effects where I can't, I lost money in the stock, I now can't pay back lenders. So it actually starts getting worse. So eventually the computer models started failing and it actually had something to do completely external. It was outside of the computer models. But the point is they were investing at such a large scale in assets and commodities and things that are really, really important that when they wanted to start selling off those investments, if millions of dollars in steel and in major things start getting dropped, that actually can drop the overall prices in the market because the demand for them goes down. So you can see how we have very wealthy people doing very risky investments. In some cases with money that isn't even theirs, they're borrowing it. And because it's on such a grand scale, when things started to go bad, it actually could hurt the overall economy when asset prices start falling across the board.
This table is showing the earnings of hedge fund managers in 2007, the year before the crisis in 2008 that started the Great Recession. So you have various hedge fund companies where their founders were making huge amounts of money. You can see the number one made $3.7 billion in one year. 2.9, 2.8. So we have people that are making $900 million in just one year. So just to give a sense of that's only the top 10 hedge funds. There are a lot more hedge funds in addition. So we can see kind of how big this hedge fund bubble was getting before it started to go south, before the bubble burst. When asset prices started falling internationally, the Federal Reserve of New York bailed out a lot of these hedge fund companies because they didn't want them to sell off all of their assets. When they're selling off their assets rapidly, it was leading to major problems and deflation drops in prices of these major commodities. So in order to stabilize the economy, they wanted to slow down the sale of these assets, and that's why they bailed out these hedge fund companies. The second major crisis that occurred in 2008 that created the Great Recession is the subprime lending and housing bubble that went along with it. So low interest rates, and the Federal Reserve does control interest rates, they tend to go up and down with the business cycle. Low interest rates created a boom in home construction. If you remember, home builders tend to finance when they're building a development. So that means that they are paying interest when they start buying the land and building the houses before they get paid when they sell them. And people that buy houses also tend to finance that. So they're paying interest too. So when interest rates are low, home builders want to build more houses, they're paying less money. Home buyers want to buy more houses because the overall payments are going to be cheaper for them. So this is going to create a housing boom that can lead to a housing bubble deregulation comes in because a lot of the regulations that limited who could qualify for home loans started evaporating they started going away so prime is good your prime candidate subprime means below prime and this is kind of a very strange way of wording not that great or not ideal so all of a sudden because there's so many homes that are being built and banks didn't feel like they had as many regulations, they start lending money to home buyers who really had no business buying a home. So this poster that says we finance everyone, or, that actually isn't a good thing. If you are part of a bank, you want to make sure that the bank is handling this money safely. We also see this cartoon, it says Wall Street. It turns out poor people with bad credit can't afford to buy a home. Who knew? So the other thing that's creating the subprime lending is that you have this new thing called a loan originator, which means businesses are popping up and all they do is originate loans, which means they're going to start the loan. So they approve you for the loan or some subprime person who wouldn't normally qualify. And then they sell the loan to somebody else. So the banks that actually purchased these subprime loans didn't start them and they were told how risky it was but they weren't overly concerned because things had been good for such a long time usually in a housing boom you have an increase in the um, in the supply of houses people keep building houses and the demand keeps going up too because with low interest rates people thought it was a great time to buy a house so the issue is, if all of a sudden you can't afford your mortgage payments, these subprime borrowers could just sell them. And they wouldn't have to go through this long process of foreclosing because before the bank had to take it over, they could sell it to somebody who could afford this house. So from the bank perspective, subprime loans weren't considered as risky as we now realize they were because people thought, look, I might be loaning money to somebody who probably can't afford this house, but I'll get 
a high interest rate from them in the meantime, and then when they are not able to continue making their payments, they'll just sell the house to somebody else. So banks viewed it as kind of a win-win situation. Also, we have something called securitization, which is loan-backed securities. Remember that term, that's when we put a bunch of loans together and banks could buy a percentage. So instead of one person originating a loan and a bank buying a loan that was risky, a bank could buy a percentage of 100 loans or 1,000 loans. And they thought that, you know, there might be some bad loans in the bunch, but most of them are going to be fine. So they had this false sense of security and the belief that so many loans together reduces risk. The problem is that more and more and more loans in these loan back securities were made up of subprime loans. So there were more weak loans in the bunch than banks realized. And when they started failing, huge numbers of loans started failing, not just a small amount. Also, when the housing bubble burst, not only could people who borrowed money not make their payments, but they also couldn't afford, they couldn't sell their homes. So in the bubble burst, that means that prices are gonna start going down. So let's say you bought a house for $200,000. It might only be worth 180,000 now. So even if you find somebody who wants to buy the house from you, you still have to pay the bank back that amount of money. So people got stuck. Now we've seen two of the major issues that started the 2008 crisis, hedge funds and the subprime housing crisis. As a result of this crisis, loans became harder to get. It is now much more difficult to qualify for a loan. The process takes longer and banks require a lot more to make sure that you are worthy because they don't want to be caught with as many bad subprime loans as they were in the past. The Federal Reserve saw this major problem in 2008 and knew that it was potential for the Great Recession to turn into a depression. Remember, the only difference between the two is a depression is a very long and deep recession. This recession was longer than normal, but it didn't deepen to the extent to be considered a depression. But the Federal Reserve wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. So some of their involvement was to issue capital into banks. We saw that it's harder, banks were more cautious loaning out money. They were afraid the loans would go bad. Also, investment spending is going to decline because in recessionary time periods, businesses are afraid to take out loans because they know that there might be a few bad years ahead. It'll be very hard to pay back the loan. So the Federal Reserve injected capital into banks. In other words, we're going to lend you some money, either at no interest or extremely low interest rates, to encourage new loans. So there's really no strings attached. Why not loan out this money? What do you have to lose? This money's just been given to you. Now, the trade-off was, if you accepted this capital from the Federal Reserve, the banks traded off by giving up a little bit of control in the banks. So this allows future regulations to try to reduce problems moving forward. Also, we saw that there were various groups. We have hedge funds and banks that were all considered too big to fail because we realized that if these giant corporations go out of business, that's going to lead to repercussions economy-wide. So the Federal Reserve stepped in and did a lot of bailouts with future regulations to prevent them from happening again but that's how we made the recession not turn into a depression.